And now the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Here's oral argument. Here's oral argument in the matter of Brendan McVeigh versus Raymond Kelly. The court decided the police can randomly search subway riders' bags, or if that search is a violation of the Constitution. This is about 55 minutes. Done. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. I'm Christopher Dunn with the New York Civil Liberties Union for the Plaintiffs' Appellants. Your Honors, the Fourth Amendment prohibition against police officers stopping and searching people without any individualized suspicion is one of our most important constitutional protections. Indeed, it is a bulwark of a free society. At issue in this case is a program that threatens to obliterate that protection and to do so needlessly. At issue in this case is an indefinite program, and I want to emphasize indefinite program, by which armed and uniformed members of the New York City Police Department, without any individualized suspicion whatsoever, are stopping and searching the closed personal possessions of members of the general public doing nothing more than moving about the city by using the New York City subway system. Your Honors, we recognize that terrorism poses a threat, a serious threat to our society. We recognize that law enforcement has considerable latitude in addressing threats to public safety. However, there is no categorical terrorism exception to the Fourth Amendment, and there is nothing in the extensive case law from the Supreme Court or this Court about suspicionless searches that suggests that this particular program, given the undisputed record that is before this court, satisfies the Fourth Amendment. Well, I take it you don't question the existence of a special need here. Your Honor, actually, we do challenge that. That's one of the two claims we make. We In what precise way do you challenge the existence of a special need? Well, Your Honor, if, if what you mean by existence of a special need is whether or not this program qualifies under the special needs doctrine, uh, we do challenge that, uh, and we challenge that based upon... How precisely? That's my question. Okay. We challenge it in two ways. Uh, first, this court has made clear just six months ago in Nicholas <clears throat> that the special needs doctrine comes into play when there's a reduced expectation of privacy of those being searched. And, Your Honors, in this instance, it is simply... Members that was the case there, because they were dealing with individuals with a reduced expectation of privacy. That's correct. They did not hold that a full and complete expectation of privacy renders the doctrine inapplicable. I agree with that, Your Honor. They did not hold that. But right. this court has made quite clear and said that that is a central element of the special needs exception. And, Your Honor, I submit there is not a single case that anyone has identified or that exists in which Members of the general public who have full expectations of privacy have been suggested to be held to the special needs doctrine. That is absolutely not so. Okay. In all of the airport magnetometer cases, there is a full expectation of privacy, yet there is a special need. In Ferguson, there was a full expectation of privacy, yet that was not the reason why the program fell. The same was the case in Edmond. No case has held that there, when there is a full expectation of privacy, the doctrine doesn't apply. Right. Judge Straub, I, I think that to suggest that this regime is similar to the airport regime and that airport passengers have a similar expectation of privacy as subway riders is incorrect. I agree with you that no the Supreme Court has not held. You're saying they're different airports and subways? I'm saying the, the expectation of privacy is different? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really? What, what's the one's up in the air and the other's under the ground? No. 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 We, look, we, 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 we've, we've, all, we've all flown in airplanes. You want to get on an airplane, you have to buy a ticket, you have to give your name, you have to give your address, you have to give where you live, you have to go to the airport, you have to get a boarding pass, you have to have a government-issued ID, you show them, and you're subject to ongoing supervision by airline personnel throughout the entire process. 
you plainly have a reduced expectation of privacy when you go to the airport. It just does not exist in the subway situation. But, Your Honor, what I'd like to do is we have said in our brief why we think special needs does not apply here. Um, we're not suggesting that it can never apply in a terrorism situation. Plainly, it can. What we're suggesting is it doesn't apply here. But let's focus on assuming it applies. Let's, not conceding that it does, but let's focus on assuming it applies. Uh, the question then becomes, under the Special Needs Doctrine, does this particular program, given the specific record before you, satisfy that doctrine? And you have to start with understanding that it is an extraordinarily narrow doctrine. As you yourself, Judge Stroud, pointed out in Palmieri, it is an exception to a basic fundamental constitutional rule. Indeed it is, but apparently this circuit is prepared to apply it even in respect of permitting when it was totally unnecessary. Well, that makes it a rather broad doctrine in this circuit. Well, Your Honor, in that case, I think that it was found that it was necessary there, and that, of course, was a very different search. That was an individual piece of property in which some agent had gone on there for 15 seconds and then had left. We are talking here about police searches of the closed containers of the members of the general public. And in Palmieri, the panel made a specific distinction between the sort of expectation of privacy there and searches of closed personal containers. But I want to focus on kind of what may be the heart of the matter here, which is the issue about is this reasonable? Is this effective? There's a well-established standard, both from the Supreme Court and from this court, that says that you have to look at the intrusiveness of the search, and you have to look at how effective it is. Essentially, is there a close and substantial relationship between what's trying to be advanced and the searches? And at this point, Your Honor, I'll make it very clear. All it has to be is reasonably effective. Isn't that right? Well, it, Rather it, than absolutely or maximally? Well, or in some formulaic fashion, foolproof? It certainly doesn't have to be foolproof, Your Honor. This court has said, <coughs> Lifshitz, minimal intrusiveness, maximal effectiveness. This, these court's words, not mine. Now, it's clear there has to be a showing that the program is sufficiently effective to advance a compelling government interest to outweigh the intrusiveness. That's the basic standard. It's a, it's a balancing test that you are required to perform, not the New York City Police Department. Well, how, let's start with the intrusiveness <coughs> side. How much intrusiveness is there if the person can, without cons adverse consequence, resist being searched at all? Well, Your Honor, I think the intrusiveness has to focus on the searches themselves. It is true that the way the program is Why? structured. Why do you focus on a search that may, never ha that may never happen with respect to any person who doesn't want it to happen? Well, it's plainly happening to a huge number of people, Your Honor. That may be, but isn't it so that it's never happening to somebody who doesn't want it to happen? Uh, it's certainly true it's never happening to a terrorist. Uh, but no, well, <laughs> fair enough. And isn't it also never happening to anybody who doesn't want it to happen? No, no, no. I, no who, I don't, I don't to whom is it happening involuntarily? Your Honor, I think there are large numbers of people. It's, it's the record. I think is quite clear about this. Given the role of the subway system in New York City, people have to take the train. They don't have to take it from that particular station. Well, Your Honor, in some circumstances that may be true for most people. They're in a rush. They're trying to get to work. Whatever the reasons are, they're not, they don't have the luxury of time to get up, get out, and go to another subway, su sub subway station. So there's an inconvenience, you're saying. They well, may have to no. go to a different subway stop. No, Your Honor. I, the intrusiveness, I, I believe, under any analysis of special needs doctrine, the intrusiveness focuses on the search. Yeah, when it happens, of course, I agree when with it happens, you. When it happens. When there's a search, you look to see, is it a pat-down or is it a strip search? How invasive is it? But when there's not a search, when you can walk away, I don't see how you get to intrusiveness at all. Your Honor, if no one were being searched, we wouldn't be here. But there are huge numbers of people being searched. By our calculations, even modestly, there have probably been a million searches. But none of them involuntarily. Well, you know, Your Honor, I don't think you can say that. I, I don't think the I think the record is clear. Well, the only example of, of involuntariness you've given me is the inconvenience of going to another subway stop. Yes. Which is hardly government coercion. Well, but Your Honor, that coercion is not the standard. Is, is what? Is not the standard. Involuntariness, if we're talking about voluntariness in police searches, 
I think the record is quite clear. There's ample evidence that the role of the subway system, and there's information about the individual plaintiffs in this case, where they clearly are not, in a Fourth Amendment voluntary sense, submitting to searches. The city has never argued that this is a consent case, and we don't believe there's any basis for that. But, Your Honor, if I could, I, I hear what you're saying, but I would like, because I know that my time is short, I would like to, to focus on the issue of the searches that we are challenging. And I don't think there's any question the police officer searches of the closed possessions of subway riders are fundamentally intrusive. That leaves us with the issue of how effective are these searches. And I think you all understand what the program is. Judge Straub, I see that my time is up. Please, you know, finish up. Thank you. Um, first, I think it's very important for the court to focus on the goals of this program. As the city itself has identified it in its own brief. And they've identified in their own brief three specific things. Increasing the presence of police officers in the subway system. Increasing the alertness of police officers in the subway system. And keeping bombs out by virtue of detection or deterrence. Okay. In their brief, they identify those three goals in order. In addition, in the record, Mayor Bloomberg, the day after he announced his program, said, you know, clearly we'll do it for a little while. It is partially designed to make people feel comfortable. That's part of the security thing. You want people to feel comfortable. You also want to have substance and make sure that you keep the potential threats away. So at the outset, I just want to make it very clear. To the extent the police department is concerned about increasing the police presence in the subway system, they don't need to be searching hundreds of thousands of people to do that. They can put more cops in the subway system. To the extent they are worried about officer well, alertness. How, you say they can solve it by just having more cops. How, how do the body of cops showing up equal the effectiveness of occasional random searches of containers? Your Honor, I am relying upon Commissioner Sheehan's own testimony in which he said the first goal that he identified was increasing the security presence around the subway system. That's what he said this accomplished. You got more cops into the subway system. It may be that you do, but you're, you just argued to us that instead of having this search program that people can resist, they would do better by just producing more police officers. Yeah, I'm only saying that if their immediate goal is to have more police officers in the subway system, as Commissioner Sheehan indicates, oh, it, it clearly, they put it, more it, police officers it, in if the, the subway goal, system. If the only goal is to have more officers, the way you solve that is to have more officers. That's tautological. Of course, and I'm not suggesting the only Let's talk about the goal of discouraging people from bringing explosives right. into the subway okay. system. Let, let's get to that, which is clearly an important goal, to be sure. Certainly is. Right. Let's look at what the facts are in the record, the undisputed facts. First, it is undisputed that the NYPD has never done any assessment of the deterrent effectiveness of this program. Second, well, what, what did you want them to do? You, I mean, you well, can't. Your Honor, I, I think that if you're going to launch a program like this where you're going to be searching hundreds of thousands of people, it's incumbent upon them to figure out whether or not it's actually effective. And, and they, how do you do that? I mean, you don't poll the terrorists, do you? <coughs> Subway hasn't been what? bombed yet, so it must be effective. Um, I take that as a rhetorical comment, Judge Bryant. Um, it, it's true that it hasn't, but it hadn't been bombed in Well, well what do you want? You're, you're faulting them for not measuring effectiveness, and I'm interested in how you would measure effectiveness. Well, Your Honor, what I am simply saying is that they have introduced nothing in the record. But how would you do it? You're faulting them for not doing something, so the thing they didn't do must be very easy to do. Uh, Your Honor, I don't know how easy it is to do or not. Well, what is it? But I think if they are... Whether easy or hard, what is the thing they didn't do to assess effectiveness? They haven't done anything. They've made no effort And whatsoever. what is it they didn't do that you want them to do? Well, Your Honor, I think that... Well, let, let me point to a couple other points of evidence that relate to that. There, it is undisputed that there is no... There are no studies anywhere of the effectiveness of random search programs. It is also undisputed there is not a single other mass transit system in the world that is using a program like this, which we suggest provides some insight as to what at least the rest of the law enforcement community thinks about the effectiveness well, of this program. Well, perhaps it would be more accurate to say that there have been no published reports of other transit systems utilizing random searches or otherwise. There's nothing in the record, Your Honor. They, they, they could have introduced, you know, they've got these experts. These are, are, are serious experts. Other cities do different things. Some European cities have cameras at every intersection looking at everybody. I take it you don't think that's 
without Fourth Amendment implications. Your Honor, what we are focused on is this search program, and my point That's is— That's right, but you're saying, well, no other city does this. I'm suggesting other cities do other things. Well, well that's right, and, and frankly, if what we're talking about is a camera program versus a search program, we're talking about a very different set of constitutional issues. But then, and most importantly, I want to focus on what—so those are the facts. Let's talk about their opinions. Let's talk about what their own experts say. And you know, we're not disputing it. We're in a, this is not a fight about experts. Their experts say, Commissioner Cohen, this program changes the odds. Anything that changes the odds, he says, we consider to be effective. And our only role in looking at that is to make a judgment as to whether that appears to be reasonably effective. It is not our role, the Supreme Court has told us, to displace and replace the politically appointed and anointed authorities who, with specific information of their own, are charged with those decisions. That's fair enough for the most part, Judge Stroud. However, l let's be clear. The Supreme Court has, since they made that statement and sits in 1990, has been quite scrupulous in scrutinizing these programs. And they've struck down more than they have upheld since then. But the point I want to make is, yes, let's accept that. You have to accept that and work from that. And this is a question, this gets down maybe to the nub of it. Is it sufficient to justify under the Fourth Amendment suspicionless police searches based upon a representation by a law enforcement person that the program changes the odds in our favor? That's it. And I submit to you, Your Honor, that cannot begin. Well, you're, be in, you're in the, it seems to me, slightly awkward position of suggesting that it's not effective enough. It just slightly changes the odds. It would be more effective if they stop everybody. And be more oppressive. Which and you don't want. Expensive. Is well, that right? Let, let, let's set aside what we want, Your Honor. To, to, what we are focusing on. Well, well, I can't set aside what you want. You're a litigant here arguing yes. that error has been committed by a district judge. So what you want is, is, is certainly something we're entitled to consider. And so what we want is a program that is constitutional and effectiveness is plain. And are you partner. suggesting it's more likely constitutional the more people they stop? Uh, Your Honor, what the record shows on this is that Commissioner Sheehan said. There was an absolute relationship between the number of checkpoints they had and the effectiveness of the program. Right, and you're faulting this for not being particularly effective. That's what we believe the record is. Therefore, you shows. must be saying it would be more likely constitutional the more people they search. That's correct, Your Honor, it would be. And therefore, it would be more intrusive, right? No. Your Honor, it the, wouldn't the be more intrusive if they stopped everybody? No, the, the searches are what they are. They, they are intrusive. The searches is what's intrusive. And we're not having, the searches. You ride the subways? Your Honor, I ride the subway every day. And you don't think it would be a greater intrusiveness if they searched everybody? Well, I think it would be, it would have a greater impact on everyone. But in terms of how intrusive the searches themselves are, I don't think the number of people who are searched. And didn't announce it, and did the searches off in private with a greater degree of intimidation, and if the program allowed interior examination of every nook and cranny of the parcel in order to ensure there was no explosive device. This is all that is part and parcel of your position that the more they do, the more the effect effective it is. Your Honor, their own testimony is the more checkpoints they have, the more effective it is. We don't dispute that. In fact, we think that demonstrates based upon the numbers you have before yeah, you. Yeah, that doesn't sealed. mean they need to go to the limit, though. Well, okay, fair enough. Of course, Your Honor. No one is suggesting that the issue here is, is there any less restrictive or less or more effective regime. The question is, is this sufficiently effective to justify police suspicionless search. So they stopped a little too soon instead of whatever the percent is, and we're not going to talk about that, uh, if they had just ratcheted it up a little more and searched maybe three times as many people, four times as many people, that would make it more constitutional? Your Honor, what I am saying is that what they are saying about this program, and I rely on what they say about yeah. this program, is that it increases the odds, it provides some incremental 
security benefit. Well, if the odds go up a little and the danger to be averted is disastrous and the person being searched can walk away without consequence, why isn't that a pretty good accommodation of all the interests? Well, Your Honor, I don't think, given the record we have here, there's any reason to believe that whatever the increase in the odds is, is in any way meaningful. And they never explain it, of course. We don't have a clue what they mean by that. What we do know is that Sure they do. If the odds go up, the or odds down, are the odds are going, yes, going down, depending on who's placing the bet. But the odds of a disaster are going down. That's what it means to shift the odds slightly, doesn't it, in this context? Conceptually, yes. But you know, if what we are talking about is but the odds have gone from one in 100 million to one to 999 of 1.9, I mean, we oh, are talking well, about when somebody, when a qualified expert says the odds are being shifted, I don't think you can fairly accuse him of making a, a, a silly, de minimis argument. Well, Your Honor, that it's you know, th this was a trial that took place on the basis of affidavits. The city spent a lot of time preparing those affidavits. Okay? You can look at those affidavits for a very long time to try to find out what they are saying about the extent of the effectiveness of this program. And Your Honor, I want to focus, I, again, I just, I feel like we need, I understand, of course, there are serious consequences. But we are talking about hundreds of thousands of people being searched by the police without any suspicion whatsoever. This but is- But help me, help me understand what you view as the precise line of demarcation where this program could be viewed by a court as reasonably effective. Well, Your Honor. You are suggesting they haven't made the hurdle. That's correct. But you're not helping me determine what the level of that hurdle should be. Right. Indeed, your witness said, Mr. Painter said, I don't know how many would make it effective. That's correct. But to be fair, Your Honor, we, I, I don't know where the We're exact- We're trying to be. Uh, I don't know where the exact line is. What I'm quite confident is that given the jurisprudence from this court and the Supreme Court, that this program is so far from what that line has to be that it cannot possibly okay. justify these searches. If you look, for instance, there are All two- right, thank you. We, we got that. You, you reserved some time for I, I just, and-, and Well, I, we've given you fine. substantial thank additional thank time. You. Mr. Shore? Good morning, my name is Scott Shore. I represent Police Commissioner Kelly in the City of New York in this case. With me at Council's table is Gail Donahue. After a bench trial, the District Court carefully considered all of the evidence, including the expert evidence, both sides furnished, carefully balanced the special needs factors, and determined that the container inspection program is indeed a reasonable, valid, constitutional, special needs program. The plaintiffs have not identified any fundamental error of, uh, of fact or any error of law, and that's why this court should affirm. Plaintiffs, in their reply brief, have finally conceded that airport security searches are constitutional. That concession undermines several of the arguments that they have been advancing on appeal, including the argument that the container inspection program is merely a law enforcement program because it is illegal to take a bomb onto the subway system. May I ask you, when these searches turn up, a gun or a paint spray can or drugs, what happens? Well, Your Honor, as plaintiffs have pointed out, during the first three months of the container inspection program, which is the point at which the bench trial occurred, the inspections had not turned up any of that contraband. But as is typical in cases like this, in Alvarado and Edwards, if the search is a legitimate special needs search, as we say it is, and it happens to turn up contraband, even though that's not what the police are looking for. But that's, that's not what's happening. Therefore, it cannot be claimed it's a subterfuge to get after general crimes. Exactly, Your Honor. There is no evidence presented here that the container inspection program is merely subterfuge for doing ordinary criminal investigation work. Nobody's been prosecuted. As far as I know, Your Honor, that is correct. So just as it's illegal to take a bomb onto the subway system, it's illegal to take a bomb onto an airplane. And yet, plaintiffs concede that those searches in airports are constitutional special needs searches. 
Similarly, the airport Well, but they say there's a difference, that the <coughs> expectation of privacy is different. The airline passenger knows they've got his name. Uh, you don't, the sub, no subway rider doesn't furnish his name to the system. He's not identified. They're different but in the, some respects. Whether they're meaningfully different is another question. But they certain, certainly are different. There certainly are differences, Your Honor. We acknowledge those differences. But to the extent that airport searches are directed at criminal behavior because it's a crime to take a bomb onto an airplane, well, then that's, there's no reason there to distinguish the container inspection program. Now, on the reasonable expectation of privacy point, uh, over time, uh, because airport security searches have become so prevalent, the Supreme Court has recognized that people have a reduced expectation of privacy in their containers when they're at the airport. But when these searches began 30 years ago, there was no uh, <coughs> There, were, there was a full expectation of privacy in closed containers, just that's, as when... That's just a as when somewhat dangerous argument, because that suggests that if, if some city decides to uh, randomly search pedestrians on the street, that may upset an expectation of privacy on day one, but after a couple of years, they'll get used to it. Well, Your Honor, I think there... That's they're, not your case, so don't get off on it. That is not our case. Uh, no, but it illustrates the point that getting used to something doesn't necessarily make it constitutional. Uh, although the Supreme Court has recognized that people have gotten used to the searches in the airports. Uh, fact, factually, they have. And maybe in that context, it's constitutional. But I doubt if getting used to it always wins the constitutional argument. Uh, all right, Your Honor. But I just wanted to point out that when those searches began 30 years ago, when courthouse security searches began uh, maybe 20 years ago, uh, there was still a full reasonable expectation of privacy in people's bags, and yet those searches were upheld as constitutional. Uh, plaintiffs themselves, uh, well, the Vermont ACLU in the Cassidy case, which is pending before this court right now, say on page 29 of that brief that although things may be different for residents of rural areas, residents of cities experience these searches in light of 9-11. So plaintiffs themselves well, their sister organization, have begun to realize that the prevalence of these searches, the terrorist acts we've seen, the, uh, and 9-11, have done something to diminish people's expectations of privacy. This court, by the way, in, in Lifshitz, at page 186, a portion of Lifshitz plaintiffs never mention, says that advance warnings can reduce privacy expectations as well. And here it's undisputed that the city has given people lots of advance warnings about these searches. But again, there, there is no, as Judge Straub was pointing out earlier, there is no requirement that people have a reduced expectation of privacy before you can have a legitimate special needs program. In fact, in Leventhal and Palmieri, this court said that the, especially in Leventhal, that the public employee there had a full expectation of privacy in the contents of his computer and yet upheld a special needs search. So what, the court, what this court focuses on in cases like Alvarado and Edwards and NG, Your Honor, the judge, which, where Judge Newman wrote the opinion, is how intrusive the search is, not whether in the first instance there's a reduced expectation of privacy. Excuse me. And in this case, Your Honors, uh, Judge Berman got the intrusiveness factors exactly right. As you just pointed out, Your Honor, people can walk away and that does a lot to reduce the intrusiveness of the inspections. Beyond that, the inspections are performed by uniform officers. These officers have very limited discretion. People are selected on the basis of uh, neutral and random criteria. The searches are quite brief. Police officers, going to your point, Judge Bryant, are trained to only look for the kinds of incendiary devices that the police department is worried about. And they are told in the first instance to do visual examinations and only manipulate the contents of the bag if it's necessary to remove an obstruction and prevent uh, a, a thorough search. So uh, given the minimal intrusiveness here, uh, the district court found that the searches were uh, valid under the special needs program. But let's look again at the plaintiff's uh, airport concession, going back to that for a moment. We recognize there are differences. Plaintiffs have argued that there is no imminent threat to the subway system. Well, given what happened in Madrid and Moscow and London, given that we have a man on trial right now for plotting to blow up the Herald Square subway station, given what the police experts in this case said about the desirability of the New York City subway system as a terrorist threat, to which Mr. Pena agreed with that assessment, 
uh, there is a real and substantial threat to the subway system that is at least equivalent to what we have in the airport context. And the Supreme Court in Von Raab made very clear that you don't need to have a specific, concrete, sort of phone call threat to a particular airplane or airline in order to justify a special needs program like this. Plaintiffs have also argued that the container inspection program is unconstitutional because it has no finite durational limit. Well, that doesn't make any difference. If you look again at the airport context, those searches don't have a finite durational limit, and yet plaintiffs now concede that those searches are constitutional. Plaintiffs also make the argument in their reply brief that in the airport context, well, it's heavily regulated, and that changes the whole equation. Well, that's not true. This, uh, the Supreme Court in Donovan, 452 U.S. 594 from 1981, said that distinctions like that are arbitrary and refused to apply them when, to a warrantless search uh, statute. And this court in Alvarado in footnote 9 said we're not, said that distinctions like this, regulatory search, administrative search, and this was before the term special needs search became accepted, distinctions like that are not ana analytically significant. What we're looking at is reasonableness, not labels. Let me ask you <coughs> about your, your view of the appropriate legal framework for deciding this. Uh, in uh, Nicholas, there were two different opinions, well, there were three, but two, the first two uh, took different, slightly different approaches in deciding what the standard was for determining when a suspicionless checkpoint could be used. And I'm wondering which of those you think is right, or are they both right, or some combination, or, or even a third one? What's well, as, as I recall in Nicholas, it wasn't about uh, checkpoints. That was a DNA indexing statute. But they talked about when you could have a suspicionless inquiry. Well, from the precedent I recall on suspicionless inquiries, uh, Supreme Court cases like Martinez Fuerte and Lidster and uh, Earls, the court recognized that it's important to have a suspicionless search in uh, areas like public safety or in airports. Martinez Fuerte said when you, have a lot, when you have heavy traffic, that was a border checkpoint case, Your Honor, when you have heavy traffic, it's really impractical to require that police officers have individualized suspicion. I understand. Okay. They, they say that. But there's still some standard to be used in deciding when you can have a suspicionless inquiry. Well, Your Honor, when the police identify a special need to conduct suspicionless searches, then we find ourselves in the framework we're in right now. The police have identified the special need to do this. After all, th this is th the problem of a terrorist bringing a concealed incendiary device into the subway system is not one of those problems that is automatically going to lend itself to uh, being detected by, say, for example, extra police officers in the subway system. It's not uh, going to be the kind of thing that police can just look at and say, oh yeah, that person looks uh, suspicious to me. Well, specifically, Judge, Chief Judge Walker outlined one approach. Judge Laval outlined a slightly different one. Do you have a view of well, which of those is, is better or preferred? Your Honor, I need to remind myself of the approaches because they're not coming to mind right now. Well, Chief Judge Walker seemed to think the first question was, is it serving a non-law enforcement purpose? You look to that. Judge Certainly. Laval suggested, no, you don't look to any one factor. You look to all of the pertinent factors and make a threshold judgment whether it's okay to do it, and then you go on to Fourth Amendment reasonableness. Well, here, Your Honor, it's certainly clear, and plaintiffs have presented no evidence to the contrary, that we are not doing the container inspection program for law enforcement purposes. And I think if you want to take the multi-factored approach, uh, we would also satisfy it, because, again, it's, it would be impractical to require officers to gather individualized suspicion. Well, that's and, what I thought. You, since you win on either one, or you believe you win on either one, you're really not interested we'll, in choosing. We'll take both, or either. Uh, but let me just point out that in Earls, which involved uh, suspicionless drug testing of high school students, the court pointed out that it would probably be less effective to require individualized suspicion. And that was because the people implementing a program that required individualized suspicion may find themselves profiling, which is certainly not what we want to do, and there's no allegation that we have. Second, the, the Supreme Court reasoned in Earls, uh, people may be so afraid of lawsuits about profiling that their uh, enforcement of the program is going to be chilled. Uh, and Mr. Shore, I, I, I've tried to listen to both of you carefully, and I've tried to pay attention to what you've said in your briefs, and it seems to me that 
the differences between you <clears throat> on almost the entirety of the issue uh, are at the margins and in nuance. It seems to me that where you critically debate and differ is on the effectiveness aspect. Would you address that? I, I, I'd be pleased to address that, Your Honor. The standard is important to keep in mind. Whether the program is a reasonably effective means of addressing the city's legitimate concerns in deterring and detecting subway terror attacks. That's from Earls at page 837. Is it a reasonable way to do it? And in SITS, the Supreme Court made it very clear that the role of the courts here, when looking at effectiveness, is not to conduct a searching judicial review, but rather to defer to the reasonable judgments of the people who are responsible for keeping systems like the subway system safe. In determining reasonableness, is it then appropriate to consider cost and the burdens placed on the innocent people who get delayed or held up if you make it too oppressive? Well, the police are in the best position to figure out how to allocate it's just effectiveness that determines reasonableness, I suggest to you. It's the other elements like the cost and the other requirements on the police manpower and how much trouble it causes in delaying the trains. Absolutely, Your Honor, and the police are in an excellent position to figure out how to do this in... No, well, but Mr. Short, yes. it's not enough to simply say the police said it's okay. Of course, Your Honor. So what is it in this case, in terms of the testimony presented, mm -hmm. which we can then look at and say, we are not attempting to make a finding ourselves, but what has been presented and unchallenged is makes this reasonably effective. Okay, the reason it's reasonably effective, according to the city's experts here, and these are not just police walking in off the street, these are people with a hundred combined years of counterterrorism experience. They, say, they explain the effectiveness by pointing out that terrorists want very badly to have a high degree of confidence that a mission will succeed, and they want very much to avoid failure. So. The container inspection program addresses this in two ways. One, as Richard Clark explained, the fact that the program exists sends a message to jihadist terrorists that New York City is a tough place to operate and the New York City subway system is a very difficult place to succeed. The temperature here is hot. Stay away. Don't even try it. The risk is too high. The second way that the container inspection program addresses this philosophy of jihadist terrorism is to, to add an element of unpredictability to subway security. It was explained by our experts that terrorists <coughs> like to plan their attacks very carefully, but it's a problem for terrorists in planning an attack if the security environment on the day of the attack differs from the security environment they saw when they were casing, in this case, the subway station. That makes it harder to plan. The uncertainty also makes it harder to implement, especially if you're talking about what terrorists would consider a highly desirable multiple simultaneous attack on the subway system. If one of the people involved in that attack confronts a checkpoint, it's going to be a real problem to try to coordinate the attack the way it was planned out. As Commissioner Cohen explained, if terrorists decide to go ahead and try to attack the New York City subway system and they hit one of these checkpoints, they have three alternatives. They can go forward with the attack, but they, ha they increase the risk of detection because of that checkpoint. That increases the risk of failure. Terrorists want to avoid failure. They can switch to a different target. In switching to a different target, they have to veer off plan. In veering off plan, they increase the risk of mistakes. They increase the risk of detection. They increase the risk of failure. Option three, call off the attack. That, from a public safety perspective and a police perspective, would be a wonderful outcome. Commissioner uh, Cohen also explained that in Moscow a couple of years ago, a female suicide bomber approached a Moscow subway station, saw that checkpoint bag, uh, a bag inspection checkpoint was set up, and instead of going into the station to detonate the bomb, she left the station and detonated the bomb outside on the sidewalk. And uh, unfortunately, we have to look at a rather grim calculus here of counterterrorism success. That was considered a successful outcome because the casualties were far lower outside than they would have been inside. Now, plaintiffs like to talk about uh, increments and percentages, and uh, they, they very selectively uh, choose testimony from the city's experts. But Commissioner Sheehan said very plainly that the container inspection program dramatically improves the security on the subway system. And Richard Clark added that because we're doing the container inspection program, 
the subway systems have become one of the least likely places in the country where jihadist terrorists would want to try to carry out an attack. That is effectiveness. That is at least reasonable effectiveness. Plaintiffs want to make this all about statistics and numbers. That's not the, that's not the analysis that's appropriate here. And SITS made that clear. In SITS, which involved a sobriety checkpoint, there was all kinds of testimony presented at trial about how effective a sobriety checkpoint would be in reducing drunken driving. But the, the, the trial court, looking at that evidence, concluded, well, it doesn't look like this is going to be good enough, so we're going to strike down this program. What did the Supreme Court do? It said, again, you don't look at the specific numbers. You don't look at the coefficient of deterrence. You look at whether the police have chosen to do this in a reasonable way. And more recently, in the Lidster case, the, uh, this was the informational checkpoint set up one week after a hit-and-run accident on a highway. And the police set up an informational checkpoint, uh, again, one week later at the same time of night, hoping that people who drove by the same point one week later might know something about what happened the week before. And the Supreme Court, the majority opinion, said this looks like a pretty reasonable way to do it. What did the dissenters say? We need to remand. There's no evidence about effectiveness here. We don't know anything from the police officers about whether it was reasonable to think that anyone driving by was going to know anything about what happened the week before. The majority said, it's OK. We looked at it. Look at the design of this. It looks like it's reasonably designed to achieve its purpose. So you don't need to have any coefficients of efficiencies, as plaintiffs would like to impose on the city here. And when we get to the random search cases, it's even clearer that courts look at the design of the program. In Earls, the random student drug tests, the court didn't consider evidence of how effective this would be. The majority said, doing random drug tests looks like it's going to be effective. Justice Breyer, writing separately, said, I don't know whether this is going to work or not. But it still looks reasonably effective. In Hudson, the cell search case from the Supreme Court in 1984, the Supreme Court said, without citing any formal assessments, any statistical analyses, any even expert evidence, it said random cell searches are a good way to deter prisoners from bringing contraband into their cells. Marquez, the Ninth Circuit, people, reason, people randomly selected for extra airport security, looks effective. Green, the Fifth Circuit, looking at a military installation random vehicle checkpoint, looks effective. It's a gauntlet, random as it is, that terrorists have to try to get around if they want to succeed. And in this court, if I could just finish the point, Your Honor, this court in Maxwell in 1996 looked at a randomly deployed vehicle checkpoint and said this looks like an effective way to do it. Yes, Your if, Honor, I'm sorry. If, if, all, if your arguments are correct, would they not also justify random suspiciousless searches at uh, either busy intersections or busy plazas like, uh, or areas like Times Square? Your Honor, this, as this court has acknowledged on several occasions, this is a fact-specific balancing test. Yeah, but I'm trying and to understand what, would be, what fact would be different other than the fact that one's <coughs> underground and one's above ground. What would, what, be, what would make it well, constitutionally different? There, there certainly is evidence that terrorists per, would prefer to strike a, an underground facility like the subway because they can be guaranteed of a higher body count and they can cause more terror because people are trapped underground. But wouldn't the argument be once you've deterred, <coughs> adequately deterred that threat, you're entitled to move on to deter the next threat? Your Honor, I, I, I don't accept that slippery slope argument. We have no evidence in the record or any other evidence I'm aware of that there's the same, that there's an equivalent risk to busy intersections of a terror attack as there is to the subject. So it's the, ri it's the documented risk that you say makes it's, it It's all different. of the factors, Your Honor. You have to look at all of the balancing factors. What is the risk? What's the need to do suspicionless searches? Uh, expectation of privacy, how intrusive it is, whether it's a reasonably effective way to get at the problem. It's fact specific. And on the record in this case, the district court looked at all of those balancing factors and concluded that the container inspection program is a reasonably effective way to do it, that the intrusiveness to the subway passengers is minimal, and that it serves a compelling government interest in public safety. If I could just add one thing, although I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Before yes. Before you terminate your argument, it's more than three months since the trial. There's apparently a great deal of public interest in the issues raised in the case. Certain papers are under seal, and it seems to me that the information in the sealed documents is at least somewhat stale at this time. And a lot of it appears to be the kind of thing where there's no secret if more than two people know it, and an intelligent terrorist could probably find them out. And I don't know why the court couldn't unseal that so that however our decision is, 
the bar and the public will know the entire record on which it was based. I have to tell you, I think sometimes too many things are sealed in the district court. I don't disagree with the last thing Your Honor said, but here we have a testimony, a, a declaration from Commissioner Cohen, who explained why it's so important to keep this particular information That's confidential. That's three months ago. What yes, they were doing three months ago. And I really fail to see why there's any need for continued secrecy. Well, Your Honor, as, as Richard Clark explained in his testimony, even if, even assuming the city were only doing a de minimis number of checkpoints, the program would remain effective provided terrorists don't know the number. We you want to think they can figure the number? No, Your Honor, and, and Richard Clark and, and other experts of the cities explained why it's in, why, why it doesn't make sense that a terrorist would just does ride around the, the subway system. Does it vary from day to day? It does vary from day to day, Your Honor. It varies from place to place. These are con why can't this three-month-old trial record be open? It can't be opened, Your Honor, because we don't want to give the people who are planning a, a subway terror attack any information that's going to help them figure out how to avoid the checkpoints. The whole thing is based on unpredictability. We need to keep it unpredictable. By Thank keeping you. this information under understand your position. If I could just add I, one thing. I, go ahead. Uh, plaintiffs have said repeatedly, including in this court today, that no one else in the world does random bag searches on a transit system. That's simply not true. A GAO director gave testimony to a congressional subcommittee a few days after the city submitted its brief. I have a copy of it here. It's GAO number 06. Well, that, that, that's not in our record. No, but it's, it's something really this court can take we, judicial we notice of. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shore. Mr. Dunn, you reserved a couple of minutes. Uh, yes, Your Honor, I reserved five. Thank you. Uh, Judge Newman, let me start with your question about Times Square. I submit to you that there is no difference between the legal principles that apply to this principle and the legal principles that would apply to stopping people on sidewalks. There's virtually no physical difference between the subway system and the sidewalks in terms of their connection and their use by city people in the city. Terrorists are detonating bombs all over the world in public places in a way that's completely comparable to what's happened in the several mass transit systems outside of this country. And, Your Honor, it is our position that if the city can do the searches it is doing here on the record that is before you, there's nothing that would prevent them from doing similar searches well, Mr. on sidewalks. No, that's absolutely not the case, because even you tell us that when and if special needs apply, and of course, if it were Times Square or Greenpoint, Brooklyn, we would have to first decide if there is a special need. To be sure. And then, and then if we decided there was one, we would have to look at the balancing factors. And they are highly factually specific. So I don't think it follows at all that if it's okay here, it's okay in every other instance. I didn't say it was okay in every other instance, Your Honor. I said it would be okay in certain places on the street, including, for Depending instance, Times Square. Depending on what that factual uh, balance established. Well, of it's, course. It's a good rhetorical position. On the other hand, I have no doubt, and I suspect you have no doubt, that if the next case concerned Times Square, you would be here with arguments why a decision in this case was not a valid precedent on a Times Square case. Would well, I mean, Judge Newman, I'm troubled to hear you say that. You're troubled to hear me For whatever that? that may suggest about where you're going on this case. But uh, oh. I would hope you have using this case as precedent I, I said my it only son. as an accolade to your ingenuity. <laughs> but another point, Your Honor, and, and Judge Stroud, this goes to your question, which you ultimately want to get at. What's the effect of this? And I think you heard a lot of talk about ways that you get to effectiveness. I don't think you heard Mr. Shore tell you anything about where in the record to look to explain how effective this program is and whether it is sufficiently effective as a matter of law, which is what you have to decide to justify these searches. And I want to go back to, for instance, the airport regime that they rely upon heavily and <coughs> ask each of you, and I submit to you, that if what was happening at airports was that at, let's say, just to take a hypothetical number, 5% of the entrances had checkpoints. 95% of the entrances were open. Anyone could walk through them. 
And at the 5% of the entrances where they had checkpoints, they selected a fraction of people going through there, and anyone was free to walk away from those checkpoints and go to another entrance and walk onto a plane. I submit to your honor, there is not a chance that regime would withstand constitutional scrutiny. And that's exactly what's happening here. That's exactly the program here. People can easily get into the system. It's easily evaded. And the Supreme Court in Chandler said, when a program's easily evaded, it's ineffective, it's unconstitutional, a special needs search case. Well, that, this, was, that the guy running for office? Yes, that's a candidate drug testing case. That's correct. And in Lifshitz, and this he gets he gets to be the candidate. Correct. It was a you had to you had to submit to a drug test to be a candidate. And it was they gave you the, the test date in advance so you could abstain. And the Supreme Court said, look, it's easy to evade. It can't be effective. It's undisputed that the checkpoints here are easy to evade. I mean, Judge Newman, you're making a point that, you know, my clients are free to go and wander off to another subway station if they've got the time and get in there. Well, look, their own testimony about these terrorists. They plan extensively. They conduct extensive pre-target surveillance of the target, and they're highly motivated. No one thinks for a moment that this is not easy to evade. But they, they don't even know where tomorrow's checkpoint's going to be, do they? To be sure. That's the one thing they don't know. They know there's a program. They know they can walk away. They're known, they know most entrances are available to them. The only thing they've got to plan for is they might encounter a checkpoint. Yeah, they got a lot, a lot more things to worry about than that possibility. So they send, I mean, look, it was explained. Well, our, maybe they have more things to worry about, <clears throat> but yeah. if that is one pretty big thing to worry well, about, it's useful. Well, I if it were a big thing, it might be, Judge Newman, but it's not a big thing. Okay, the prospect that, and you've seen the numbers, they might encounter a checkpoint and they have to plan around that. There's no dispute that these things are easily evaded. And I submit to you, whatever may be the situation, we are talking about something like the airport regime or the courthouse regime. No one gets in here without going through the checkpoints. The regime they have set up by their own choice has such marginal, inconsequential effectiveness according to their own testimony that we submit to you as a matter of law. It cannot, it cannot override one of the most fundamental constitutional protections we have, which is that police officers do not get to stop and search us without any individualized suspicion whatsoever. That's what's happening here. But you don't think it would be constitutional if they searched, stopped everybody, do you? Your Honor, there, I don't think there'd be any question that if they were stopping and searching everyone, it would be an effective program. We would not have any argument about effectiveness. But you'd say it was unconstitutional. I don't know what we would say about that, Your Honor. Really? And if we get to that, we may be back here. <clears throat> we're dealing with one program at a time. Thank you. Thank you both. That was well argued. We'll reserve decision. I, I think we have all your points. <clears throat> you are reminded, excuse me, Mr. Short. You, you are reminded, of course, that uh, the materials which have been filed under seal, the briefs which have been sealed, as well as the motions attendant thereto, remain under seal unless and until this court speaks otherwise or until another court finds a way to provide you with any other relief. Uh, thank you. The remaining cases on today's calendar are taken on submission and we are adjourned. Another chance to hear the oral argument on America and the Courts tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN. President Bush announces the resignation